You're listening to Neon Jazz with Joe Domino. Hey, Gary. Okay. All right, we're, we're in the saddle here. We're in the saddle, good. <laughs> I'm going to start right off the top because this is okay. topical. Dave Brubeck, do you have any good Dave Brubeck stories? I had a chance to play with Dave Brubeck once at Avery Fisher Hall. At um, He wrote an, uh, some octet music in the late 50s that I, I don't think was played too often. And uh, so he had a chance to present this music. And uh, so I got called to do the gig and... Uh, that was the first time I had met him and uh, and played his music, and his playing knocked me out that night. I mean, I just I was riveted listening to him. I mean, I had heard him play on record, and I heard him, I never really heard him play live too often, and certainly never played with him until that time. And uh, I was just really taken with uh, how swing and how harmonically, uh, you know, his harmonic concept. And I mean, I, I just it, being on the bandstand with him is so a totally different thing than listening to him on record. And also what a beautiful human being he was, how humble and warm and genuine and uh, just, you know, he just, I mean, he just, he loved being a musician. And uh, it was, uh, I, I'll always remember that night. And I'm, uh, and uh, his passing is, is really incredibly sad and it's a huge loss for music. Well, I'll tell you what, he had a long run, that's for sure. He had a long run and... He, he wrote some beautiful tunes. If you look at, you know, the Duke and in your own sweet way, and uh, I mean, he wrote some really incredible music. Well, he passed on some good genes, Chris, and another son play music. So the Brubeck name is going to be around for a while. Yeah, no, no, it's uh, he, it's, a, it's a pretty amazing legacy what what he left to the world. It's uh, it's really beautiful. Absolutely. Before we dig into the beginning of my interview, I also kind of want to start here with, since we're in Kansas City, have you had any gigs or experience here in Kansas City? Uh, you know, I played there a handful of times, not too many, but I played at the Jazz Museum once or twice. Uh, but no, I'm not, not, I, don't, I don't get there as much as, I, as much as I'd like. I know it's, I mean, the, the history of, of Kansas City is so deep, you know, all the musicians who came from there, but, and uh, there's always, I always feel like incredible going there, just feeling, you know, birds came from there, and just, I mean, just going, you know, being, experiencing the energy in that town is so beautiful, I love going there, but uh, I really wish I, I, I wish I got out there more often, but, uh, but I have to try and figure that out. First question I have for you, you grew up in Long Island, what was it huh? like to grow up in that area and to have that as a mold for your love of jazz? Well, when I was growing up on Long Island as a, as a teenager, there was an amazing club in Seaford called Sonny's Place, which presented the jazz seven nights a week, and uh, they would have like local musicians or area musicians play you know, Sunday through Thursday, and then, and Friday and Saturday they would have have big names. I mean, I saw so many people there: Lee Konitz, Al Cohn, uh, Chet Baker, uh, and the list just goes on and on. And Steve Grossman. I mean, there, it, it was really an incredible scene. I mean, and there's nothing like that on Long Island anymore. That was uh, once he passed, Sonny passed, and the, he, the, the club kind of went out of business. That was that was kind of it. But uh, in terms of a local scene, he presented incredible music so that was my education i i was there almost every night and uh, uh was really fortunate and i was also really fortunate to grow up in a period where there were a lot of excellent musicians uh who really would become lifelong friends who uh, were really deep players like uh, uh kenny werner and uh gerard d'angelo who's not there not, who's not really you know necessarily the household name but Great musician, was very active in New York. Uh, another pianist, Gary Dial, very active in, in education and teaching and playing. And uh, Glenn Drews, trumpet player, Billy Drews, his brother, saxophone player. So, I mean, so many musicians were uh, coming up at that time that uh, it was just uh, a rich period. And also there were great music musicians living on Long Island. The saxophonist Billy Mitchell, the trumpeter Dave Burns, um, and one of my first teachers, a saxophone player who played with Buddy Berrigan and Artie Shaw. He was he was amazing. Not exactly again a household name, but a real vital force during that time on the Long Island scene. His name was Joe Dixon. So it was uh, it was a pretty pretty cool place to grow up, and uh, and uh, it was I mean in terms of education and being exposed to this music, it was uh, a really um, amazing experience. So when you were a kid, did you always want to get into jazz? No, I didn't. Uh, I. I and I didn't really, um, well, how I came into jazz was really a big accident. Uh, I was playing saxophone in the school band and playing electric bass in the really terrible 
kind of cream wannabe band with guitar and drums, and I think we did one gig, and, uh, you know, I was into rock like everybody else growing up in that time, and uh, I was kind of channel surfing on the radio when I was about 13, and uh, heard Fats Waller playing African Ripples, and that was an epiphany for me. I was like, whoa, what is that? I never heard anything like that in my life, and uh, so I said, well, they said, that's out this Fats Waller, and, you know... Yeah, it was a jazz station, and I just never, in my wildest imagination, heard that music before. So I was really, that just kind of, bit, I was bitten by that bug. And uh, also, at that time, there was a great radio show on WRVR, hosted by a fantastic DJ, legendary New York DJ named Ed Beach, who had a show called Just Jazz. And uh, he would play jazz five nights a week, Monday through Friday, from 10 to midnight, and he would focus on one musician every week. So, cool. play five days of Kenny Dorham, five days of Bill Evans, five days of Benny Goodman, five days of Charlie Christian, five days of Bird. Just, I mean, he would just get really deep into one artist for a whole week. And that was, I mean, I listened to him every night for years. That's cool. He wrote a lot, wrote a lot of liner notes for, for, you know, LPs at that time. So he was, he was really a huge force on the New York jazz scene in terms of, of, of playing music. Um, so I really was addicted to his show. So it was a lot of right time, right place for me. It was just, you know, Long Island happened to be a real fertile place uh, for young musicians and a handful of places for young musicians like myself, aspiring musicians, to play and sit in and grow and, and get some experience. Um, so it was, it, was a, it was a pretty rich scene when I was growing up. Well, you know, uh, the great Billy Joel's from there too, and he's he had he has jazz in his blood. Oh yeah, you can hear the way he plays piano. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. He um, never showed up to any of these gigs, though. <laughs> you know, so, why did you pick the baritone sax? That's a good question because I didn't pick the baritone sax. The baritone sax picked me. <laughs> um, I was a diehard alto saxophonist. Just Charlie Parker, Phil Woods, Cannonball, Benny Carter. Excuse me, that's, I was in strong alto saxophone world and never in my dreams or imagination ever thought I'd ever play the baritone. It, was, it wasn't anything I thought about. It wasn't anything I fantasized about. I never really even listened to baritone players when I was younger. Um, but I had a group on Long Island with, like I said, mentioned Glenn Drews before, the trumpet player. He got called to play with um, Woody Herman. And so he left Long Island went on the road with Woody Herman's band, and about six months later, the baritone chair opened up, and uh, he recommended me, because we'd been playing together for a long time, and uh, so I got the phone call, and uh, it, was, you know, it presented an opportunity to go on the road for, uh, at that point, Woody was still touring for 50 weeks a year, um, and playing almost every night, so that was something that, uh, you know, I couldn't pass that up, so... Um, I went out and bought a baritone, and on May 25th, 1978, met the band in Bridgeport, Connecticut, and uh, got my little, my student model Yamaha baritone out and sat next to Joe Lovano, and <clears throat> that was the beginning. I just, uh, after those two years, I stayed with Woody for two years. After those two years, I, I just, I was, I mean, that found my voice, or well, the baritone found me. Um, sure. It's funny because... Uh, Woody's pet peeve was alto saxophonists who played baritone, which fit me to the T. Because when I was first starting to play, you know, I, I had I had technique from the from the alto, but I had really no baritone concept at all. No, not a good sound. Uh, you could tell a mile away that uh, I was not a real baritone player. Like the person I replaced was a great baritonist, Bruce Johnstone. He's uh, one of the great all time great baritone saxophonists. And he left the band, and I took his place. So I thought I was going to get fired every day for the first six months because you know Woody knew. But yeah. there was something. There was something that uh, something that he heard that he liked, I guess. And uh, so I, I I stayed in the band for two years, and uh, and it, it, I just I just fell in love with that sound, and uh, I never played the alto again. So I tell my students, you think you're on a path, you think you're going on a straight road, and Something happens, a phone call, or something happens where you change direction, and you just keep going the other way for the rest of your life. You just never know what's going to happen. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. It was like two two things happened. You know, hearing Fats Waller on the radio, which if I don't know if I never heard Fats, if I never heard that piece, I don't know what would, I don't know what I'd be doing today. And if Woody Herman's never never called, um, I, I'd still be playing alto. And but I I don't know what my life would be like. That had those two things had to happen. Absolutely. Well, you know, you have to have your flashpoints, I guess. Yeah, everybody. That happens to everybody. Yeah. Let's go back to some formative years. When you were in high school, I read that you sat in with Chet Baker, Ray Nance, Lee Konitz. What was that like? Those experiences. Oh well, that was uh, they, those experiences really um, crystallized the idea that I wanted to become a musician. And uh, so, I, like I said, I, I just I had a chance as a teenager at these at. at this club, Sonny's Place, um, Bob Hoover at that point, a great saxophone player, was playing with Chet Baker, and I was 16, and uh, I wanted to sit in, because I was, I mean, I, I was, you know, I was serious, I practiced all the time, I wanted to play, so we were sitting at the bar, he was having a drink, and I was drinking some soda or something, and they had a jukebox, and uh, the jukebox still played 45 records, you know, 45 speed, little singles. Mm-hmm. And uh, so they had Charlie Parker with strings playing Just Friends. And Bob told me, he says, if I can sing that solo from beginning to end, he asked Chet if I could sit in. And that was one of the tunes that I listened to, I mean, just over and over and over again. I could, I could do that in my sleep at that point. So I think, I, I think that was a little surprising to him that I could do that. And so uh, because I kind of passed, passed his test, I got to play, play a half a set with Chet. Very nice. Uh, and just, woo, just, you know, the thing is, when you play with musicians like that, like Lee and Chet and Jimmy Knepper and Ray Nance, the thing that strikes you more than anything, standing next to them is their sound. And that's for the whole, that for my whole life, that's been the whole, my, you know, really important. Like, okay, what is your sound? What is your individual sound? And these guys have such a personal sound and such a personal approach that uh, that was the thing you, you know, you you hear Chet Baker on record, and but when you stand next to him and hear that, it's like man, it's you can't believe it. So yes. it, was, uh, it was an amazing education. Absolutely. So I'm going to piggyback off of this. You've shared the studio with the likes of Dizzy Gillespie, Freddie Hubbard, Chip Corea, Tito Puente, Ray Charles, and others. What was that like, and who had the biggest impression on you? Wow. Uh, they. I think they all did. Um, that's really a hard question to ask. And I mean, that everyone who I've ever played with has influenced me in some way or another. Um, Dizzy with his, I mean, he was so consistent. And like I said, like going back to the, the, the answer to the previous question is, you know, when you, you to hear their, their sound, you know, Stan Getz, well, I had chance for, I, you know, I did a record with um, Woody Herman. We did a record in, from live at the Monterey Festival with Dizzy and Stan Getz and Woody Shaw. Um, and Sly Hampton, and man, I think Stan gets played. What are you doing the rest of your life? And uh, just the sound is just so incredible. So that's really hard to say who's had the most. But the thing that that uh, that that did strike me was is how nobody who I've ever played with ever just phones it in. You know, mm-hmm. they just they're serious all the time, and they're very serious about the music, no matter what the situation. Uh, and that was a really serious lesson too. It's like, well, you know, you got to play like it's the last time you're ever going to get a chance to play. And everybody who I ever played with always played that way, and that always stayed with me. Cool. So, as a student and a journeyman in bebop, talk to me about why this idiom means so much to you. I love playing on uh, chord changes. I love playing the American Songbook. I love playing blues. I just that's what really sings to me as a musician. You know, music that's funky, music that's soulful, music that's swinging, um, trying to develop a good good sound, a personal sound. Uh, you know, I still listen to Charlie Parker every day. And uh, for me, he's the, you know, I'm still trying to scratch my way to even, you know, shine his shoes. You know, so uh, that's the, for me, the, the highest point in music still. Uh, and I'm always going to be a student of that, just because... That's what really sings to me more than anything. Speaking of being a student, why was Pepper the Knife Adams such a huge influence on you and your work? Well, I mean, for me, Pepper Adams was 
the most important post bop baritone saxophone in terms of playing changes, in terms of, in terms of sound, in terms of time, in terms of rhythm, in terms of uh, harmonic language, in terms of sense of humor, intelligence. Uh, I think he's untouchable. Like for me, you know, uh, I love Jer- I love Jerry Mulligan. Um, you know, and and everyone else, but when I hear Pepper play, it's like okay, this is it. Yeah. So, in all the shifts and evolutions that jazz has gone through throughout the years, what do you see is the most important? Uh, well, for me, I just think, you know, I, I think it's, I mean, I would just have to say, you know, uh, in terms of modern playing, in terms of harmony and, and concept, I would just really would have to say the little, you know, the last thing really has been Coltrane. I, you know, from, I have to start from my point of view in terms of how the music I like to play and the music I like to listen to. Uh, I, I, for me, that's that's really it. And you know, there's really I, there's nothing really new under the sun in a lot of ways. I mean, in terms of stuff going on today, um, you know, odd meters. Don Ellis was playing in odd meters in the late '50s, right? Uh, in terms of uh, playing free, completely free, Lenny Tristano was playing completely free with uh, Billy Bauer and Lee Konitz and Warren Marsh back in 1948. You know, so I mean, I think. Uh, you know what's new? I don't know. I mean, it's it seems to me that uh, a lot of things have, have uh, kind of come full circle, but you know, have been around for a long time. Sure. What venues or cities do you like to play the best? Well, you know, going down the stairs to the Vanguard is still sacred ground to me. That's funny. Someone asked me that that same question the other day. Um, I still get goosebumps when I when I go down those stairs. Because the you know the vibes of Sonny Rollins and Bill Evans and Coltrane and Lenny Bruce and the Weavers and all the people that played at that club and performed in that club are is still in the in the air in the walls in the chairs it's everywhere I mean every note mm. that ever played in that place is still in there so I mean you just there's a feeling that you get when you walk down those stairs and walk into the club that's uh, it's just man it's like going to a church. What does it mean to you to receive accolades like Grammys and Downbeat Magazine's Best Of designation? How how does that fuel you as a musician? What do those honors mean? Well, it's 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 nice to get the critical rec- you know, recognition. I mean, recognition from the critics and the readers and the listeners. And uh, you know, I, I just it just makes me want to just you know keep working and keep doing what I want to keep keep doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, you know, I, I I try not to get too excited about it even i think it's very nice um but i think if you have if you're like wrapped up in that world and worried about you know that kind of recognition and those accolades and uh and you know then it doesn't happen you're setting yourself for uh you know a disappointment so uh i'm thankful and i'm really i mean it's it, you know the last couple of years has been <clears throat> pretty amazing for me in terms of uh you know career-wise things are really kind of on the upswing and going really well uh, and for that, I'm grateful and happy to have the work. And uh, I'm just ready to. I'm, I'm starting. A, I have a four day tour. Tonight's the first gig. I'm in Brandon, Vermont, um, doing uh, four duo gigs with Ray, Ray Drummond on bass. Very cool. <clears throat> that could be great. So tonight's our first gig, and uh, I just finished a six week tour of Europe and did a whole bunch of teaching at the Amsterdam Conservatory and some teaching in the UK. and so things have been uh, this has been good. I've, I'm recording another record in January for Capri. Um, so you know, I, I think th- this is a good period. Right on. So, as the artistic director at Berkshire, what is it like to both teach and play? Right. Well, the Berkshire Hills Music Academy was not do that anymore, but I, I, I did that for four years. Okay. That was a music. That was a music school for um, adults. Who are you know who have a, a gift for music with developmental disabilities, intellectual disabilities? So that was uh, that was kind of a cool thing. Um, just, just being around musicians like that kind of makes you kind of reevaluate your life and what things what's important. And uh, it was, that was a kind of a cool place. But I mean, I do a lot of teaching in general. Right now, I'm affiliated with like I'm the saxophone professor at uh, Amherst College in Amherst, Massachusetts. And I do a lot of master classes, a lot of residencies, and and to me, um, it's a it's a form of giving back and a, a way of kind of continuing 
the mentorship that I had when I was young. I mean, I had so many great teachers and so many people, great musicians helped me when I was young and I was, you know, eager and hungry and trying to get information and trying to play. And I always remember that. So um, when, you know, serious musicians come to me for help or they want a lesson or they want to study, it's, it's you know, it, it's kind of, a, for me, it's obligatory because it's, it's a way of giving back and, and really kind of saying thanks to all the people who helped me. Excellent. So it's been said, it's been quoted, Gary is considered the standard bearer of his generation for the baritone sax. Do you agree? <laughs> That's for other people to say. <laughs> Me to say. You know, I mean, I, I can't say that. I mean, there's a lot of people playing the instrument, you know? Sure. I don't know. That's, 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 that's for other people to decide. So, of all the musicians you've met, I'm sure there's plenty you haven't. If you could go back in time and meet two from any era, who would they be and why? Uh, I'd want to meet, uh, well, boy, only, only two. Yeah. Well, we'd go two or three. Okay. <laughs> I'd want to meet Duke Ellington because I'd want to just shake his hand and thank him for all the incredible music that, he's, that he contributed to the world. Uh, I'd like to I'd say Charlie Parker. Um, do them just the same. Just shake his hand and just say thank you for uh, you know creating this incredible music that even today is is you know challenging and 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 uh, you know incredible to play and to listen to. And probably Louis Armstrong just to because he's the beginning of it all. Absolutely. So, what music are you listening to right now? Well, I listen to a lot of different things. I listen to a lot of twentieth century classical music. Um, I'm a big fan of, there's a Polish composer, composer named uh, Witold Budoslawski, whose music I absolutely love. Uh, I have, oh man, my iPod is a crazy mix of all kinds of stuff. I have uh, Luciana Souza, who I'm a huge fan of. She does a, a, she has a couple of duo records with Romero Lombombo, the guitarist. Uh, she's on there, Joao Gilberto. Uh, I have a lot of Pepper Adams bootlegs. I have a lot of Rare Charlie Parker, uh, boy, I just, I, you know, it's, it, it really depends. I, just, I put my iPod on shuffle and whatever comes up, <laughs> uh, that's what I'm into, you know. So I, I, I just, I, I, every, I, mean, I listen to most everything, and and, uh, and everything because of that is is influential. So when you look back on your jazz career, do you have any regrets? Anything you'd go back and change, or anything you wish you would have done differently? Uh, well, I think one thing I would have done, it's not, and it's not too late, is that, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I never finished college. I, because I, I joined Woody Herman's band in, uh, in, you know, the end of May, uh, in, in 78, uh, that was my senior year of college, and I had to, you know, it meant leaving school, uh, and both my parents are teachers, you know, so I, I, you know, it would be a gift for them to kind of finish up. I have four credits to go to get my bachelor's. Wow. Uh, I've never, I just have never had the chance to go back. So, if anybody out there is interested in giving me an honorary bachelor's degree, <laughs> honorary doctor, any listeners out there, <laughs> it would be so beautiful. You'd make my parents happy. They're 80 and they're 82 years old. Yeah, that'd be a nice gift. Features. So, you know, so that's that's kind of, that's the, I think that's the one regret. Because, I mean, in terms of career-wise, and I've really had a chance to play with, so many incredible people, and I'm so thankful for that. But that's the one thing that's, uh, you know, that's kind of um, incomplete, let's say. It's an unfinished business. Let me just, I'm coming towards the end of my interview here with you. Um, and again, thank you very much for taking your time out. This has been a delight. Since we're in a social media world where Twitter in particular is kind of a art of brevity, if you had to define your career as you look back on it now and put it in the length of one tweet, what would you say? I don't know what a tweet is. It's, it's just a short sentence. It's 144 characters, basically the length of one sentence. Okay. Um, I'm very thankful and fortunate. No, I'm, I'm very thankful that I've been able to live in this beautiful world of music. Gary, that is all I have. I know you're on the road and you're getting ready to go to your gig, so I'll let you get back to it. All right. We'll see you soon. Take care. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate the uh, opportunity to talk to you. Absolutely, sir. Continue success. Bye. Take care. Neon Jazz.